It's Dr. Jenkins. Here we are back for our next chapter. This chapter is going to be on digestion and absorption. But in other words, if we're talking about sports nutrition, not only do we need to talk about the nutrients themselves, but we have to have an understanding of how these nutrients, carbs, fat, and protein, are digested and absorbed. Because nutrients are digested and absorbed differently. And that impacts how quickly we can absorb them and metabolize them. It impacts the amount of energy it takes to do that. And therefore, it, uh, it should notify our decisions on what to eat and when. All right, so let's just jump right into it. Uh, digestion and absorption. Just to get things started... If you don't already know, please meet Joey Chestnut, reigning 13-time Mustard Belt winner. Even this past year in 2020, he won the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest on July 4th. Does anybody know how many hot dogs he scarfed down? You might want to vomit in your mouth a little bit, but he ate 75 hot dogs and buns in 10 minutes. Can you imagine? And he's been doing this for 13 years. Yikes. Okay, so here's going to be our outline. We're going to start with some basic anatomy. So we're going to go through the digestive system. And as we discuss the anatomy of each organ, we'll talk about what it does. So we'll talk about its structure, and its function. Then we're going to talk about the accessory organs, which are the liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. And then we're going to get into some more specific information relating to sports nutrition. How different nutrients are digested and absorbed differently, and then how the absorption and our ability to use them is affected differently between the nutrients. I mean, this is good stuff. Okay, so we're going to be pretty straightforward. Make sure you review the functions of the digestive system. A lot of these should make sense to you. We have to be able to bring in the food or ingest it. We have to be able to do digestion. Digestion simply means to break down. So in this case, digestion is the breakdown of food. It turns out, though, that there are two different types of digestion. Okay, so we have, let's write it out here just so we're clear on what you need to know. We have mechanical digestion and we have chemical digestion. Here it's called physical, but we could say physical is the same thing as mechanical. Mechanical digestion is to break down through mechanical means. Let me say that again. Mechanical breakdown is to break down through mechanical means, such as what the mouth does what the stomach does. So through chewing in the mouth, when you chew, it's a mechanical, it's a mechanical way to break down the nutrients into smaller pieces. In the stomach, the stomach churns, kind of like a washing machine. That's a mechanical way to break down food. But we also have chemical digestion or chemical breakdown and chemical breakdown is to break down using enzymes, which we're going to talk about later. So not only can we break down food through mechanical forces like chewing or like the stomach churning, we can also, we must be able to break down food using chemicals or enzymes. So enzymes help us to chemically break down food. These are important definitions, so make sure that you know them. 
And then we have absorption. And these are happening in chronological order. You first have to ingest the food. Then you have to break it down into smallest pieces through mechanical and chemical digestion. And then once you've broken down the food into its smallest structural part, then you can absorb it, which means absorb those nutrients into the bloodstream. So to absorb or move the nutrients into the bloodstream. And that can only happen if we've broken down the food or digested it into its smallest pieces. We can't absorb a big, huge piece of a bagel. <laughs> That's just too big to absorb into the bloodstream. But if we break each nutrient down into its smallest pieces through digestion, then those smallest pieces can, in fact, be absorbed through the digestive tract wall into the bloodstream. And why is the bloodstream so important? Because the bloodstream can transport those nutrients. It would all be for nothing. It would all be for naught if we didn't get those nutrients into the bloodstream. Because the bloodstream is what allows those nutrients to go to the muscles or to the brain or to the liver or any, any cell in the body. Lastly, anything that was not digestible is eliminated or pooped out or released as waste into the porcelain goddess, ha ha ha, the toilet. So anything that is not able to be digested and absorbed, because there's some things that just continue to move through our GI system without being absorbed, and that's fine. We need some of those things like fiber to help keep pushing things through. Um, anything that's undigestible gets pooped out as waste. So there you go, a, a simplified look at the functions of the digestive system. All right, let's move into the anatomy. Now, we have the digestive tract or gastrointestinal tract, GI tract. This is what food moves through. So we can literally trace the path of food starting with the oral cavity into the mouth then down into the pharynx or throat, then down the esophagus into the stomach. From the stomach, food will go into the small intestine. From the small intestine, whatever is left will move into the large intestine. And then things will travel up and around into the rectum, which is the holding tank for our poop. And then eventually, when we want to, we will release our poop, our waste, through the anus. What I just went through is the digestive tract, the path of food as it goes through the body. It is open-ended on either end, the mouth or oral cavity and the anus. But most importantly, it's what food moves through. Now, we also have what are considered to be some accessory organs. And they're considered to be accessory because they sit outside of the GI tract. And our three big accessory organs would be the pancreas, liver, and gallbladder. Here's the liver upper right quadrant, that person's upper right. The pancreas, it's kind of hard to see. Here's a little tip of it, but the pancreas is behind the stomach and it looks like that. That's the pancreas. And then the gallbladder is just a little ball underneath the liver, right? These three are all considered to be accessory organs because they sit outside the digestive tract. 
which means food does not directly pass through them. However, they are still just as important. They just have different functions. So even though food doesn't directly move through the liver, pancreas, or gallbladder, they still are essential. We still need them in the digestive tract. And what we're going to find out in the digestive system, and what we're going to find out is that these are the organs that produce those enzymes. If you remember, we said that there's mechanical digestion and then chemical digestion. Chemical digestion is to break down food using enzymes or chemicals. And these enzymes, for the most part, are produced in these accessory organs. It is pretty straightforward, but there's a lot of organs we're going to be talking about. So make sure that you're giving yourself enough time to study. All right, we're going to first go through the digestive tract. Okay, that's what food passes through. For each organ, we're going to talk about the basic structure and then the function. Okay, the oral cavity. In other words, the oral cavity, it's really the mouth. There are some other, actually there's many specific structures in and around the mouth. But we're just going to keep it simple. It is the mouth. Okay. Um, it's a form. It's how we ingest. As you know, our tongue contains taste buds. So to help us keep food coming in, we have taste buds that make the food taste good. Makes us want to eat. And then we have mechanical digestion. So one of the big functions of the mouth is after we've ingested the food, our mouth, through chewing, helps to mechanically digest the food or mechanically break the food down into smaller pieces. By the way, the fancy word for chewing is called mastication. I'm not going to ask you that specifically, but if you want to sound smart, you can throw that out. Um... Also, what you may not know is that the mouth is able to do some chemical digestion. And the mouth can do chemical digestion of starch, but no other nutrient. The mouth is not able to chemically digest proteins. The mouth is not able to chemically digest fats, really. Excuse me. And the mouth is not able to chemically digest the simple sugars, but the complex sugar in the form of starch. We can actually begin chemical digestion of starch in the mouth. And that's because it's a really big, complex carb. So the idea that we can begin chemical digestion earlier is good. Because it's so complex, there's a lot to break down. So we want to get a jump on getting that chemical digestion starting early. All right. Next, we have the pharynx, which is really the throat. So I'm coloring it in here, the throat. Of course, we're not going to call it the throat because that just wouldn't be right. But it's the next passageway. So food comes in through the mouth. And then the function of the pharynx is simply to act as a passageway for food. So there's no additional digestion happening here. There's no mechanical or chemical digestion. It's simply a passageway for food. Excuse me. I do want to make a point, something unique about the pharynx. Usually in our GI system, we have smooth muscle that make up the walls of those organs. And smooth muscle is involuntarily controlled. But here's a case where, even though it's a GI organ, the outer wall of the pharynx is composed 
of skeletal muscle. And that is because we want the muscle here to be voluntarily controlled. Because you want to be able to voluntarily control... Oh, I didn't mean to say... That's not what I meant to say. I meant to say... Swallow. You want to be able to voluntarily swallow. You choose when you're going to swallow that food, of course. So because we want that action of swallowing to be voluntarily controlled, we have to have skeletal muscle in the wall of the pharynx. Further down the GI tract, we're going to start to see smooth muscle, which is involuntarily controlled. Okay, so remember, you should be studying, you should be reviewing um, exactly what it is I'm talking about. And I'm trying to circle and underline and write down the most important points for you. Okay. So again, you want to begin to put this together. We had the mouth. Then we have the pharynx. And then we have the esophagus. And the esophagus is very long. And similar to the pharynx, its function is to act as a passageway. There is no additional digestion happening in the esophagus. It is simply a passageway for food. There's my little kitty making an appearance. Well, hello, Kima. You're making an appearance in the video. Okay. This is how things work when we're working from home. <laughs> All right. Um, what I want to point out is that the wall of the esophagus contains both skeletal and smooth. What happens is the upper part of the esophagus is surrounded by skeletal muscle. And that's because we want to continue with the voluntary swallowing. So the pharynx and the upper part of the esophagus are skeletal muscle, so you can voluntarily swallow. But then the lower part of the esophagus, the esophageal wall, is made up of smooth muscle. And that's because we want the process to be taken over involuntarily. After you swallow and get the food into the esophagus, then the rest of the esophagus is going to take over involuntarily. And we're going to see that the rest of the GI organs, their walls are going to be composed of smooth muscle. Something interesting to point out is that the esophagus lies flat when empty. Okay? So if there's not any food, if you're not swallowing, the esophagus is flat. And it only will expand once you swallow. And we got a picture. Here's an actual cross-section of the esophagus. And you can see it's got a very muscular wall. So this entire area here is muscle. That's purple. But you can see, let me change to yellow. If there's not any food going through it, it is flat. But then when you swallow, the esophagus can expand to allow for that swallowing piece of food. Pretty cool. Um, there's a couple of things I want to point out. I'm just looking ahead to make sure I have it somewhere. I'm going to talk later about these sphincters. So let's just put a pin in that because I'm going to talk about it later. So you will need to know what a sphincter is. Um, but I'm going to address it in a little bit. Okay. Um, as I mentioned to you, when we swallow, the beginning part of it is voluntary. And all that is is to say when you bring food in, the initial process, here's that piece of food, right? The initial process of swallowing it is voluntary because the wall of the pharynx is made up of skeletal muscle. But as we get further down in the esophagus, it becomes involuntary. 
So lower in the esophagus, you really can't see that arrow, can you? There we go. Lower in the esophagus, the esophageal wall is made up of smooth muscle, which means the process is involuntary. Okay? Does it for you. Now what we're going to find out is the esophagus is going to lead the food into the stomach. The process of how we push that food through the esophagus, that rhythmic contraction of the esophageal wall, that is something called peristalsis. And these arrows are trying to show you that. So the walls of the esophagus contract at one location and it squeezes the food down. And then the next location will contract to squeeze the food down even more. So it's a series of contractions higher, a little bit lower, and a little bit lower. And by kind of sequentially squeezing the esophagus, it pushes the food down and that process is called peristalsis it is involuntarily it's involuntary because it's being uh, performed by smooth muscle all right let's get to the stomach so we brought in food through the oral cavity or mouth down through the pharynx down through the esophagus the esophagus is going to lead into the stomach. Now, before we go on, I want to ask you a question. How long do you think it takes food to get from the mouth to the stomach? You bring the food in, you chew it, you swallow it, it goes down the pharynx, down the esophagus. How long does it take for it to get from the mouth to the stomach? You might be surprised. Probably about five seconds. It doesn't take long, folks. After we swallow, after we swallow, it moves quickly. But now that we're on the stomach, the process is going to slow down. All right, let me erase this. I'm getting the hang of this program, I think. Let's talk about the stomach. It is on the upper left quadrant. In other words, if you look at this actual human, this is their left and their right. So you can see the stomach is on the upper left quadrant, opposite side from the liver. It's kind of shaped in a J shape. Um, okay, I'm going to come back to the wall structure, but let's first talk about the functions. I think it's an easier place to start. Here's a nice view of the stomach up top, and then at, at the bottom is a, a cadaver, so a, a human, a human dead person stomach. What are the functions? Well, the stomach does mechanical digestion of food. The stomach walls contract, and it churns the food like a washing machine. And it does mechanical digestion of all nutrients. Mechanical digestion of all nutrients. And then the stomach can also do chemical digestion of protein. The stomach is only going to have the enzyme that can help to chemically digest protein. We cannot chemically digest carbohydrates. We cannot chemically digest fats in the stomach. We can only chemically digest protein in the stomach. And the third function is that the stomach stores food because food's going to stay in the stomach about one to two hours. And the food needs to stay in the stomach that long to enable the mechanical digestion and the chemical digestion of protein to occur. It's 
so make sure you review those. I do have a note at the bottom, but I'm not going to ask you this for a test. The stomach does not do any absorption. So we don't do absorption of carbs, fat, or protein in the stomach. However, some drugs like aspirin, some drugs like aspirin can be absorbed through the stomach wall. About 20% of the alcohol we bring in is absorbed through the stomach. That's one reason why we can feel the effects of alcohol so quickly. Okay, so there's no absorption of carbs, fat, or protein as a side note, there can be some absorption of drugs like aspirin and alcohol through the stomach wall. I'm not going to ask you that on the test. I'm just pointing it out. Okay. A couple more odds and ends to get through here. and I apologize for going back and forth. I want to talk about the rugae. Some say rugae, some say rugae, either way. Make sure you can define, oh, there's a typo, gastric rugae. These are folds in the stomach wall. If you look at this picture on the bottom, you can see, let me change color, that the inner lining of the stomach is kind of like up and down. So in other words, there's these folds. Another picture is here. If you look at the stomach, you can see these folds. You can even see it here, right? When the stomach is empty, we see these folds. However, when the stomach becomes full, the folds stretch out and the inner lining becomes smooth. So the function of these gastric rugae is to allow for stretch because indeed the stomach wall can stretch quite a bit. If the stomach is empty, we see these folds. But when the stomach is full, these folds are going to uh, smooth out because the stomach has expanded. All right. I also want to point out something called gastric pits. Don't get too caught up in, because there's a lot more to know about this, but we're just going to be very basic. If you look at the this picture here, we can see that there's these depressions. These are called gastric pits. There's these little holes, depressions in the stomach wall. And they're called gastric pits. Gastric means stomach. Pit means it's a pit. <laughs> but the function, there's, there are cells that line these gastric pits and their function is to produce hydrochloric acid. They actually produce other things. Like they also produce the enzymes that help us to chemically break down protein. But for simplicity, we're just going to say that the gastric pits, one of their main functions is their cells that line those gastric pits that produce hydrochloric acid. Good. Let's talk about hydrochloric acid. It is the most acidic thing in the body. A low pH means it's very acidic. I'm not going to ask you that number. However, if you know anything about the pH scale from 0 to 14, 0.8 is like epically low. And the, the reason why this hydrochloric acid is so acidic is because it helps to kill bacteria. And it does other things, and it does help to break down proteins, but we're going to leave it at that. So we want to make sure 
that the food that we bring in, we kill all the bacteria and all the other stuff. Think about E. coli or salmonella. You want to make sure that we're keeping all that bad stuff out of our body. And our defense against those things is hydrochloric acid, extremely acidic. This is why sometimes if you, when you vomit or if you have acid reflux, there is hydrochloric acid from the stomach coming back up into the esophagus, which is the wrong way. But the esophageal wall is not built to handle the acidity of hydrochloric acid. So that's why you feel the burning because actually the hydrochloric acid is, is, is you know, literally burning the inner lining of your esophagus. But the stomach wall is indeed um, structured to handle this acidity. And you can see here that the stomach does also perform peristalsis, rhythmic contraction of the muscles in, it wall, in its walls to help churn and move food through the stomach. All right. The last thing I want to mention about the stomach is something called a sphincter. And I think that a better picture is actually right here. There is a sphincter right here, pyloric sphincter. Let's first define what a sphincter is. And I'm going to write it down so we can make sure that we're all clear. A sphincter is a thickening of muscle in GI tract wall. So what happens is we have muscle in the entire wall. So lining the entire stomach wall, for example, lining the entire stomach wall is muscle. So what I'm coloring in here is all a layer of muscle. But what happens is at a sphincter, the muscle becomes thicker. And I think you can see that as I come along here, Right here, it gets much thicker. And it's thicker on both sides. So that area where the muscle is thicker is called a sphincter. Even though there's muscle throughout the stomach wall, the area where it's thicker is called a sphincter. And as it says here, what a sphincter does is it controls movement of food. Okay, so the idea behind this is it's a way to control the movement of food. When a sphincter is open, like this one is, food can move through. In this case, where this sphincter is located, when the sphincter is relaxed, when those muscles are relaxed, food is able to move from the stomach into the small intestine. However, when that sphincter, here it is at rest, when that sphincter contracts, the ends of each side of the sphincter come together. And when the sphincter contracts, food is not able to get through. So this is how we regulate movement of food from one organ in the digestive tract to another. We have these thickenings of muscle and when they're relaxed, food can move freely through it. But, when that sphincter contracts, food cannot move through it. Okay, so it is through the con contraction and relaxation of these sphincters that we enable, we can regulate or we control the movement of food. 
You don't need to know any of the specific names of the sphincters, like this one is called the pyloric sphincter. You don't need to know that, but just know what a sphincter is. Thickening of muscle contracts and relaxes to help control or regulate the movement of food from one organ to another. We have them in the esophagus, we have them in the stomach, okay? Good stuff. Let's move into the small intestine. The small intestine is small in diameter, but longer in length. So it's, it gets its name because it's small in diameter, but it is much longer than the large intestine. All of this in here, this is all small intestine. Could be as many as six feet long if you were to unravel it. That's pretty wild. I mean, come on, six feet just shoved into your belly there. If we talk about some structure, like I said, it's smaller in diameter, but it's very long. So we're gonna put very long. Okay. It does contain, if you look up close at the wall of the small intestine, it contains these hairs. These hairs are called villi. And what they do is, is they increase the surface area. We wanna maximize the space that we have to do the job of the small intestine. It needs a lot of space to be able to do its functions. So not only do we make the small intestine six feet long, but we also add some hairs to it, some villi, that increase the surface area even more. In the wall of the small intestine, there are something called lacteals. And these are gonna be shown as green on the pictures. So I'll put a little green here. They're usually shown as green on the pictures. The importance of the lacteals, which is right here, right? This is what will absorb fat. And I'm moving ahead of myself a little bit, but that's okay because I know you can handle it. What we're going to find, let me make this a little bit easier. All right. What we're going to find is, oh, I don't want that. I want this. Perfect. What are our possible nutrients for absorption, our macronutrients? Fat, Hold on, I meant to do that in green. Let me, actually, what if I make them all yellow? How about that? We have fat, that's possible to be absorbed. We have carbs that we can absorb. And we have protein, right? What we're gonna find is the carbs and protein are absorbed through the small intestine wall into the bloodstream. So we can see the blue and the red. The blue and the red here are the bloodstream. So carbs and protein get absorbed into the bloodstream, red and blue. But the fat gets absorbed into the lacteals. It's a different structure. I mentioned this before in, a, I think it was chapter two, fats can be a real pain in the butt. They're more difficult to break down and they're more difficult to absorb. And we're seeing here one thing that makes them more difficult to be absorbed. Fats, because they're lipid soluble and not water soluble, they cannot be absorbed into the bloodstream. So we have to make a little end around. And the end around is something called lacteals, shown as green. So fat and fat only, when we do absorption of nutrients, the fat has to get absorbed into the lacteals, the green little vessels. All right, what are the functions? And these are in order. The first thing that the small intestine does is it does chemical digestion 
of all nutrients. Chemical digestion of all nutrients. Up to this point, we've only begun to chemically digest a little bit here and there. We began starch digestion, or excuse me, we began chemical digestion of starch in the mouth. We began chemical digestion of protein in the stomach. But that's it. So once we get to the small intestine, now we have the enzymes that are going to enable us to chemically digest all the nutrients. I'm going to talk about the rest that's on there later, but for now, let's just get the basic functions of the small intestine. Chemical digestion of all nutrients. And then, after chemical digestion, after we've broken the nutrients down into their smallest structural pieces, only then can we perform absorption. And of course, absorption means to move these nutrients into the bloodstream or the lacteals. Now that we know that fat goes into the lacteals. But this allows the nutrients to be transported, which is very important, transported throughout the entire body. This is the only place where we can absorb carbs, fat, and protein. If you recall, the stomach could do some absorption of alcohol or some absorption of drugs like aspirin. But the stomach cannot absorb carbs, fat, or protein. It is only the small intestine. Really important jobs. Okay, let's continue on. So the small intestine leads into the large intestine, and I'm showing you on purpose because this is that lower right quadrant is where the small intestine meets the large intestine. And then whatever is left moves through the large intestine in this direction, up and around. The large intestine is larger in diameter than the small intestine, but it is shorter than the small intestine. And SI is just shorthand for small intestine. Okay, there's different regions. You don't have to know these. If you're wondering, this is called the ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, but you don't need to know those. There are some sphincters and also some valves to help regulate the flow. And of course, this is gonna lead into the rectum, which is the holding tank for poop, and then the anus is the exit chute for when we need or when we want to release our waste. The functions, here we go. What does the large intestine do? It forms poop and it absorbs water. Not carbs, fat, or protein, but water. And in the large intestine, we absorb a lot of water. And of course, we know that word absorption tells us that it's absorbing water into the surrounding bloodstream. Your body does not want to waste water. Your body can reuse that water. We need water. So instead of pooping out all that water, I mean, your poop should not be that watery if you're healthy. Instead of pooping out and wasting all that water, excuse me, we can reabsorb that water into the surrounding bloodstream. And that's really important. In fact, the movement through the, small, the large intestine is slowest. So whatever is left that gets into the, small in, the large intestine, it moves very slowly. And it moves slowly. Maybe it takes 12, 24 hours to get things all the way through the large intestine. It moves slowly 
to allow plenty of time for us to absorb the water back into the surrounding bloodstream. Formation of poop and absorbs water. Very important. Okay. Um, I kind of glossed over it because it's pretty simple. Make sure you review rectum and anus. The rectum is just the holding tank for poop, storage for poop, and the anus is literally just a hole, but it's our exit chute. So make sure you review those. I have talked to you already about sphincters, which are thickenings of muscle. In and around the anus, which is our exit chute, right? We have a collection of sphincters, and I, I want to talk about this because I think it's important. The internal anal sphincter, which is this in, let me turn to yellow, which is this internal thickening of muscle. That's the internal anal sphincter. And it is made up of smooth muscle, which tells us it is involuntarily controlled. So you don't, <laughs> this is a benefit because you don't want to have to think about contracting your internal anal sphincter to keep the poop in. Can you imagine having to voluntarily remember? Oh, contract internal anal sphincter, keep poop in, keep poop in, contract internal anal sphincter, keep poop in. We would forget because we have lives. So it's by design that this internal sphincter is smooth muscle. But the outer or the external anal sphincter is skeletal muscle. And we want to have skeletal muscle around and skeletal muscle is gonna be voluntarily controlled because when the time comes to excrete that waste, we wanna be able to voluntarily do it. So this arrangement allows us the best of both worlds, an involuntarily controlled internal sphincter to keep the poop in, but then a voluntarily controlled external sphincter. So when we know it's safe, when we're at the toilet, we can release that poop voluntarily. All right. I'm going to stop, and this will be our first half of the video. When we come back for part two, we're going to finish the accessory organs and then talk about some nutrient-specific and sports nutrition-related stuff. See you then.